Hi, I'm Rob, I'm the founder of Derby Computer Museum and I'm joined here today by Simon Phipps, legendary video game designer, to talk about his career in the video games world, what got him into it, um, and to find out a little bit more. Uh, thank you for joining me, I really appreciate it. Thank you, very, very welcome. So, tell me what got you into the world of video games? Um, I grew up in the 70s and was really, really, uh, I've always been art, um, motivated and um, was fascinated by cartoons so I kind of grew up wanting to make my own animations was never able to get a cine camera to do that and then uh, back in 1981 I went to a friend's house and saw he got a little ZX81 uh, 1k Space Invaders that he was, he was running he and his dad had um, built it from a kit from an electronics magazine oh, awesome. and I was like this is fantastic do you think, you, you know, the, the little character A's that were moving around on the screen as Space Invaders, and literally the screen had to burst to static between each update. It was that, yeah. that low-powered. So, you know, the little A's there, could I change what they look like? And he was like, well, yeah, you could change it to any other character in the alphabet. I was like, I can put art on the screen and make it do things. So I then was became interested in computers, um, saved up, and in May 82 got a BBC Micro Model A, and then set around learning how to program it. Um, taught myself basic, and the first thing was was kind of putting little characters and sprites on screen. And um, by teaching myself how to program, um, copying things like Pac-Man and stuff like that, and making my own versions. Um, so that's how I, I got into it. And so, so what you're trying to say is we should lock you in one of the rooms downstairs with our BBC <laughs> and not let you out until you've written a sort of spoke game. <laughs> well, I think I can remember some um, uh, 6502 assembler and I'm certainly naming basic still, so I'll get something. Um, but yeah, so I, I um, spent that time kind of copying and, and uh, making stuff in the, uh, you know, kind of that uh, were echoes of the arcades and stuff. And... Um, one evening, one of my friends, a chap named Stu Gregg, who uh, one of the schoolmates, who actually went on to work in the games industry for a while, uh, was around my house and said, oh, game you're working on right now, why don't you um, send that off somewhere that's good enough for somebody who's published? And what I got was a little guy on a jetpack flying left and right across the screen, collecting um, fuel canisters and taking them to waiting spaceships and going obstacles in the middle. Um, sent it off to Micropower in Leeds and sure. they came back with a list of like 10 changes and said if you can make these 10 changes, yeah we'll publish it. Uh, and one of the changes was to name it Jet Power Jack, which they came up with the name of. Um, so yeah, um, uh, 83, 84, I had my first game out on, on cassette on BBC Micro, uh, converted to the Electron, they did a version on um, Commodore 64 and that was whilst I was still at school. Oh wow! Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well done, you. Thank you. So your first professional job, uh, bar bar uh, the game that you published while you were at school, mm. your first job was at Gremlin, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right, so yes. how did you end up working at Gremlin? Um, I finished school with terrible A levels, A level results. Went and did serious computing at what was Trent Polytechnic in, in Nottingham and did all sorts of serious computing for two, three years. Came out of that and went into uh, desktop publishing, working at a company in Long Eaton called LaserMaker, uh, where I was writing BCPL front end for um, a uh, uh, typesetting um, software that they got. So this was about the time of Venture a Publisher had just come out of that. Everybody was talking about mice and all that lot, and they employed me to write a mouse interface. Mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time also working out what you do when you click on the right button and all that lot, because that stuff hadn't, hadn't even been established. Um, so anyway, I'm working in this little tiny cube farm with uh, far too cold air conditioning. I was there for about five, uh, five months. And a friend of mine, Terry Lloyd, phoned me up. Now, I've known Terry from working in first part computers in Derby, which was a computer shop in the main center under where Marks and Spencer's is now in the, uh, the big main shopping center. And I've worked there on Saturdays and over, over the summers and stuff. And uh, Terry and the small gang of guys that used to frequent the, sh uh, the store had uh, got a job at, at Gremlin. They'd actually written a game, um, Bounder, on the Commodore 64. Mm -hmm. That got published. They got employed. I think Terry got hired after uh, Bounder uh, by them. And uh, they had, because um, Gremlin was um, based in Sheffield, 
able to on commute back then to go from Derby to Sheffield every day. So they actually blown and set up a small like office in Derby on the top of Frygate in Saxon House. Um, so yeah, student accommodation, isn't that? Yeah, I think yeah. so, yeah. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, Terry was working on um, Masters of the Universe, the movie, the computer game, so based on the Dolph Lundgren film of the 80s. And they needed somebody to supplement the graphics. So he found me up and said, oh, fine. do you still draw? I was like, yeah. He said, are you interested in uh, coming in and seeing the guys and showing what you can do? So I put together a little disc of um, some bits of graphics I've, uh, I've drawn on. Like the portfolio. Yeah, on the Atari SD. Went in thinking it was kind of like a freelance uh, sort of job and they offered me a full-time job. Oh, sweet. Like, cool. So I started as a graphic artist working in the Derby office on Master Universe and did um, a number of cycles for uh, Gremlin, just basically doing that. Oh, awesome. Good on you. So, core design, you spent a, a quite a bit of your career there, didn't you? Mm, yeah. um, so, how was, how was core born then? Right, so uh, we were working in the Gremlin Derby offices on about uh, three or four sort of titles. Um, and then what happened was that Gremlin hit this kind of cash flow crisis where they had to start kind of reining things in. And one of the things they turned around and said, sorry guys, we're going to have to shut down the Derby office. No, but, if you want, yeah, <laughs> but if you want to come work for us in, in Sheffield, um, we're happy to have you, but you know, sort of thing, otherwise we'll offer you redundancy. And um, we kind of all looked around and thought, well, we kind of like working here and stuff like that kind of thing. We'll probably take the redundancy. And at that time, um, Kevin Norman, who was the one of the founders of Gremlin, and uh, Jeremy Smith, who was the sales manager, um, uh, came down to see us and said, hey, what if we set up a new company um, and you guys work for us here in the office, you know, sort of thing. And so we went, yeah, all right then, and carried on from there. So Core Design came out out of that one, uh, with, set up by Jeremy, Kevin, and then Greg Holmes, who was our manager in the uh, Derby office. Oh, awesome. So, something I didn't realise until, so Simon very kindly, before we did this interview, invited me round to his house, uh, and sat with uh, me, him and his wife, who sat behind the camera, making sure that it, it doesn't mess up. Um, and he, he's got a very, very organised portfolio of everything he's done, and I'm obsessively organised, it was like mecca for me, looking through this stuff. And we're scrolling through it, and there's this A4 page on just you know, written paper, like lined paper, with a whole bunch of core design logos. And I didn't realise until then that it was you that designed the, the core design logo. Yeah, um, it was one of those kind of like the first few days of like, right, I need a name for the company. I want it to sound like Rare. That was what um, Jeremy came up with. So we were kind of coming up with very similar things. And Rare Core, that's where that came from. And then it was, we need a logo. So I just sat down and just drew maybe about 30 different sort of things. One of which was based on circles with a Pac-Man for a C, O-R-E kind of thing. And uh, I think the, the office was, uh, it was originally going to be called development, but because of the sort of names that you could get at company house or whatever, it had to be changed to call design. Um, and so we lived with this kind of like circular logo for quite an amount of time. And then when Core, was slightly after Core became a publisher, um, that the logo then got upgraded because they actually there's actually a font out there called Baby Teeth, which right. has got the sort of Pac-Man C oh, kind really? of shape. So that's where the more modern um, uh, version of Core Design logo came from. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. So Rick Dangerous. So Rick Dangerous was what led me to you. So mm. I basically spent some time stalking Simon on the internet. As you do, you know, uh, late at night, um, and um, my interest was was having I mean, setting up Derby Computer Museum was creating um, video content around you know, people who've been in the games industry, specifically people in Derby. And I didn't realise until going through the Derby Computer Museum project that Rick Dangerous was created by Paul Design and was created by people in Derby. And what was quite significant for me was. I used to play that game when I was a kid, and I used to play it on my Atari ST, which is uh, downstairs in our British room. And uh, then through a bit of Googling and a bit of stalking, I found you and I was like, wow, this is a guy, or one of the guys who's on, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, very kindly, you you didn't call the police, you didn't get a restraining order, and you actually replied to my emails. And uh, kindly, you, you came in to do this video. So talk to me about Rick Dangerous. How did the, the concept for that come about? Um, well, so we started off with the call, and it was, right, guys, we need some ideas to pitch out there, because we were kind of a little independent developer, and we are going to need to sort of uh, sell some concepts or do some conversion work for... Uh, for somebody. So one afternoon me and Terry Lloyd, who, who were both the artists um, at, in our little group, um, sat down and went through a list of like, right, okay, what hasn't been done? So we listed out all of the sort of genres of various different kind of um, uh, things that had been um, been done at that, at that time, you know, whether it was racing or whatever. I remember distinct memories that Black Tiger had just come out in the arcades from Capcom, so that was Swords and Sorcery gone. So we're kind of just listing all these sort of things, and then we just went, there's never been a really good Indiana Jones game, has there? There was some in the arcades and a few little bits and pieces, but for us, they never captured that moment in the very start of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is the only good Indiana Jones film. <laughs> I don't like to say fun. But, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, um, but that, that initial moment where he's running through like these myriad traps and things and dodging blow darts and all that kind of adventure, it's like, that would be great in a game. Could we do it? So what we did was sat down with some big pieces of paper and um, I had an idea of how we could actually code up a, a system that would give us all of those kind of traps and blood guards and things without um, costing us too much code. We'd create a little tiny system that we'd feed animations and movement data into and then create all the wealth of, um, of, of kind of variety that we got in the final game. And I kind of had this idea in my head, drew it out on, a, on, a, on, on paper, which actually you've got copies of in the museum. Yeah, um, And I challenged uh, Terry to come up with as many ideas that he could think of to see whether my idea of how the system would work would do it. So it's like, okay, blow darts flying his head, blow darts that just, you know, shoot at him, spikes that appear, disappear, things that crush on you. And went through, it's like, it's gonna work. So pitched it out to Jeremy and he went, yeah, cool took it around and um, he got the kind of go-ahead from what was, was fine at the top of it, wasn't it, kind of thing. Um, the the that point, right there, yeah, you know, sort of thing. So we then sat down and uh, performance, the small group of us, so that would be myself, Terry Lloyd, um, Dave Pridmore on uh, Amstrad and um, Sinclair Spectrum, um, Stu Gregg on PC, myself on uh, Amiga and ST, and Commodore 64 was, oh no, actually, you say, uh, yeah, it was Stu, I think it was John Kirkland on PC, I think. There was a yeah. PC version, wasn't there? Yeah, it was a no, PC no, version, okay. yeah, yeah, uh, VGA graphics and stuff, so yeah, oh. there was a little tiny group of us. Dave Pridmore wrote the little music, which was uh, a translation of the Indiana Jones music, Transposed. Um, I drew all of the characters um, and I coded the Atari and Amiga versions whilst Terry did all the background graphics and then we had um, Bob Churchill and Rob Toon doing all the level design using their um, Instagram and Commodore 64. So you were talking about the original artwork and your, your sketches so in the museum downstairs uh, we've, we've done our best to theme the museum and one of the rooms is uh, I call it the British room but I, th I think it's from the title is um, highlights of British computer gaming history or something along those lines and we've got various machines set up each with a game you know showcasing something that we've done in this country and one of those machines is actually my Atari ST that runs Rick Dangerous and below that we've uh, got scans that uh, Simon very kindly gave us showing the actual original sketches so if you get a chance to come into the museum it's really cool to see the actual sketches of the little bit dangerous character and then actually see it on the screen to the game so you're kind of seeing that life cycle it's really cool so talking of the the sketches mm -hmm. and designing the characters one thing that i always noticed is the the box shows a very rick dangerous style sorry a very Indiana Jones style character, yeah. almost like a complete rip off. That's that's what it looks like, and it's a very handsome man. Mm. But the actual character, Rick Dangerous, I mean, it's a bit hypocritical for me saying that, is a funny short little man. Um, 
a little short fat little man um, and he's quite comical looking you can't quite see his eyes um, why why the difference and, and why why was he so short so it was a massive surprise to us when the boxes turned up and went hey this is the box art and we're like okay it looks nothing like the game we've been <laughs> making but whatever and, and actually with the sequel they carried it through and took the same artist and the same look and everything so yeah that's fine so that was kind of their marketing thing where the look and the, uh, look and the style of the, uh, the characters came from, I grew up on sort of uh, IPC comics of the kind of 1970s, so Wither and Chips, Whoopi comic, and all of that kind of uh, artwork. So my cartooning style as a kid was all of this sort of stuff. There was also um, an artist called Mordio, I think that's a Spanish artist in the, in the 70s, that did all these incredible posters of really intricate scenes of, like, say, a pirate galleon with, like, 200 small characters all in different costumes and things like that all over them they were kind of the sort of thing that you'd walk into an Athena poster store and have racks of those or the, the, the sort of stuff of jigsaw and I always liked that sort of style so I think those were sort of the influences of it so that's kind of how Rick kind of got that sort of weird little stodgy look the other side of it is, is sheer practicality um, one of the things that most of your early video game characters all had to fit within a sprite and to get the, those sprites were square or on the Commodore 64 they're actually 24 pixels by 21 deep. Yeah, it was uh, yeah. the kind of thing. Um, so what we did was um, when we came to actually designing Big Dangerous, um, we played to the strengths of all the machines and tried to make one version that could go across right. all, uh, all platforms, because what we didn't want to do is end up doing five yeah, sets of levels, day, yeah. five sets of new sprites and whatever. So um, what we did is we took the smallest screen width, which was the um, Spectrum, uh, which was 256 pixel wide. That's why it's got kind of black bars on the Amiga and the, the ST. And then the other restriction was the um, sprite size of the Commodore 64. So all the sprites were drawn 24 by 21 pixels. So they made them nice and squat and fit in that mm -hmm. style. And then the other sort of side of it is if you look at anything from Sonic the Hedgehog all the way back to Mario, they're all in this nice compact sort of size because you mm -hmm. end up, you can fill, uh, fill it with lots of colour and then you've just got this little box that you're sort of bouncing around the scenery. Yeah. Um, say it's one of those kind of ones in later titles, it was kind of my, I've always wanted to do more realistically proportioned characters, but the problem is, is that at the kind of resolution you're doing, they always look like stick men, so uh, <laughs> it was kind of like that kind of cartoon style of the arcade was kind of a, a byproduct of um, the hardware, um, you know, sort of thing, and, uh, and the fact that we were sort of to make the most attractive looking games, it was fill that little box with, with colour and then ping it around the screen. Well, I don't know, that, that's one of the things I've always liked about Big mm. Dangerous, though, in, in that. It doesn't take itself too seriously. He's got he's quite a comical little man, mm. and you know I've always really liked that. And, and and in terms of the comedy as well, one of the mm. things that I was quite thought was quite funny whenever he dies, he goes wah, mm -hmm. and apparently that wah was was you as well, yes. wasn't it? Yeah. So um, very very early days of digitising um, audio on the on the Atari, and um, one afternoon was like right. We need some ridiculous sound effect because the whole point of it was just to make it stupid. Um, so Terry and I um, sat there in, a, in, the, in, in the office, put on a, a cassette recorder with a little tiny condenser mic and just sort of sat there going, <laughs> like this kind of thing and making all sorts of <laughs> kind of crazy sort of sounds and then just pick the one that sounded the funniest and it just happened to be mine. Awesome. Oh, I love it. Now, talking of the, the game designers you were talking mm -hmm. about in terms of the restrictions that you had at the time. Mm -hmm. um, something you were telling me about when you kind of uh, had me over was how you made the game in columns. You're, you're going yes. top down, not left to right. Why, why was yeah. that? But again, part of the part of the restrictions of, of well, it was one of those kind of things that what we need, what we wanted to do was to minimise the amount of extra work so we could get it out as fast as possible over all the formats. So. Sideways scrolling on some of the, um, uh, and certainly smooth sideways scrolling on, on the, some of the uh, computers back then was a nightmare. It was even hard, uh, difficult on the Atari ST. Oh, really? Yeah, the, the Amiga and the uh, Commodore 64 had hardware scrolling, 
everything else, it was kind of it was software, so you had to do all sorts of trickery to take copies of what was the other side of the screen, pre-rotate it. Oh, oh, God. Like, yeah, it's lots and lots of grunt kind of software power, which um, you know to try not to allow memory at the same time. Yeah, yes. exactly. You know, so I think when I did some smooth scrollers um, in later games, but it was it was a it was a massive effort. So what we turned around and said, well, what we'll do is for the less powered machines like the ST and the Amstrad, we'll make it flick screen. So once you get down to it, wait, it'll pop and bring up the next piece. And then for um, things like the ST and the Amiga, we'll smooth scroll uh, and everything. So that kind of lent at all the levels to being these tight little 256 um, pixel wide columns, and then kind of connect them with connecting um, screens uh, from there. So again, it was just one of these kind of ways that we could build one set of levels and it would work on all of the uh, yeah. systems. And then, so if you look at the design of the, the screen layout, it's kind of almost built in, I think it's third. So, you know, you can kind of pan up and know that you, you'll always see um, what you want, you know, a bit above you and a bit, uh, a bit below you on the Atari and, uh, sorry, uh, on the um, Spectrum and yeah. the Amstrad picture in motion. Mm -hmm. The idea is that each one of these columns represents what's on the uh, on, on the screen here, um, and then basically each little uh, division is a flick screen on the spectrum or a little panning sort of thing on the Amiga and the, uh, the Amstrad. Um, quite interestingly, say so we got the old joystick controls out there, and it was a, a matter of trying to get as much uh, stuff onto one as many actions as to one stick because you've only got eight directions and a thing. So it was the idea of pushing up to jump and then using the fire button to then use different um, directions to activate the dynamite and, and all its various different inventory and stuff quickly. So one of the things I'm really keen to do with Derby Computer Museum is document and preserve computing history. We are a museum after all. And when I say we, we're a, we're a volunteer run organisation, we're a charity, none of us get paid. But one of our missions uh, is to preserve their history because usually when you go to a museum, you know, the things you see are hundreds or thousands of years old, whereas in a computer museum, I was born in 1983, but a lot of these things were created in my lifetime. We've got some older stuff as well, but I, I find that really interesting. And one of the things I also find really interesting is the, the software that was used and the techniques that were used back in the day compared to how we do things now, because of course, Back then, as you've spoken about in your dangerous days, there were quite a lot of limitations that you had to work mm. through. So, so talk to us about the actual, like, the software that you'd use, like the software packages mm. you'd use to actually design the sports and stuff okay. like that. So one of the things was, when, uh, was literally 40 years ago this year when I started, um, um, computers were actually designed to be programmed. So you got your BBC Micro, switched it on, mm. came Bam, on, to make sense. onto it. Um, for for uh, back then, I wrote my own utilities, so my own sprite editor and everything to give me the data to uh, do, to do things. When it came on to Rick Dangerous, the Atari ST um, was similarly uh, accessible, um, and uh, basically the the means of programming it was a text editor and um, an assembler, which would just take the contents of the text editor, turn it into the program file, and you could then run it. Uh, and then from an art point of view, there were a couple of art packages kicking around the Atari ST, but the main one that I used was a thing called OCP Art Studio, that was okay. from Rainbird Software, if I remember rightly. Um, that was brilliant. It actually divided the screen into two halves. You had a big 64 by 64 pixel zoomed in grid here, uh, a whole series of little icons of various different things, from line drawing to fill and you know, kind of uh, uh, things. 16 color color palette, and then a little area of the screen where you could then kind of test out your sprites so you could actually create sprites of different sizes, animate them and everything. It also had a rudimentary map editor in there so you could mm -hmm. test out all of your kind of block and character combinations um, before passing those on to a specialized editor. And did this, this software package you run on the ST then, did it? Yes, it did, yeah. Um, and then what I actually did with the, um, because of course, Everybody was working on different uh, different sort of systems. What I actually did was I wrote my own little utility, which we call the sprite puller, um, for some reason or other. Uh, and basically what it meant that I could actually draw all of the art on the Atari, um, draw 16 color dangerous sprites, then draw two color ones for the uh, Spectrum, draw 
sort of uh, double width pixel colored ones for the uh, Amstrad and stuff, and then basically take those images, pass them through my utility, which would convert them into the direct data that I could then pass onto disk to the guy, so that then we could have a really fast turnaround of, uh, uh, of art. So it was that sort of thing of, um, back then it was, you kind of grew your own utilities, but there are only a couple of things that had uh, to do. Um, the then we moved into a massive phase where the consoles came out, and consoles were really expensive. You only ever hired them from someone, so you you know when you're working on some Sony console, you would you effectively pay a large sum of money to have this piece of hardware, like the dev kit, yeah, you know, the dev yeah. you know, kind of the dev kit, which would attach to a PC. You didn't own it. You didn't you know go to think you had to go back to Sony or Nintendo at the end or whatever, and it was impenetrable. So it was one of those kind of things that drew a massive line. In the sand for anybody wanting to try and get into computer games. Yeah, because, because of course originally yeah. you'd be able to get into it without any barriers. There was exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we went through this huge period of maybe about twenty years where, unless you kind of you you know you had to do a, a computing degree or something or other like that, or be really technical to get in and start uh, making games by yourself, because the, the console manufacturers were sitting over there, and then come you know, kind of 10 years ago uh, now, um, things like Unity and Unreal, mm -hmm. um, these huge game engines, became free and accessible to all. You've got open source software, so now you can go on there and you can pull up kind of like GIMP or Krita, which is like Photoshop equivalent, Blender for 3D package, Audacity for your, for your yeah. video editing. All of really with things. a few of those in my job, yeah. I don't do yeah. games at the moment. Unreal, Unity, there are some other specialized sort of game engines and you can just dive in and, and get in. So we're in this kind of thing where, uh, once again, we've kind of gone back to this this sort of thing where the computers and the, the, the abil ability for ordinary people to get in and make games have just skyrocketed. So um, the game that I'm working on right now with uh, my friends at uh, Three Fields Entertainment is a racing uh, driving game called Recreation. It's a huge open world. Um, one I think about the fifth biggest open world in a, in a ed that's ever been built for a game, something insane like that. And we're doing that with seven people, all in Unreal. Um, and uh, basically now I've, I've actually returned weirdly to becoming an artist. I, I do 3D art as well as like 2D art and stuff like that, working in Photoshop and Illustrator, um, blend for the 3D models. Um, but now with all of these kind of like tools like Unreal, it's been easier um, for small developers like ourselves because we're only seven people to just dive in and make games that can sit there alongside the AAA ones. So the, you, you mentioned the company you work for now, how long have you been working for them? Um, I think we're coming up to about our ninth year. Um, sure. I met the guys, I was, I, previous to, to this, I was working for Electronic Arts and then eventually their Criteria, Criterion Studios uh, division. and. Um, after a number of years there, my two bosses, Alex Ward and Fiona Sperry, uh, decided to leave because they were kind of um, done with big, big corporate uh, environments and said, right, okay, then we're, we're going to go set up and if you guys are interested, we might be on the other side. So uh, a small bunch of us went, yeah, okay, we'll do that. So we left and regrouped after, uh, after some time. And um, since, yeah, for the past nine years, we've been working together on a series of uh, uh, projects all based around the Unreal Engine on um, all the latest kind of consoles and PC. Oh, awesome. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about how the computer games development scene in Dolby originated. Well, my route into it was um, through the computer shops that were in, in Derby. And I think actually that's kind of the truth as well in uh, other cities. So uh, like in Sheffield, Gremlin grew out of just micro and a small group of people that um, grew there. In uh, Derby, it was first by computers that was up in the main centre in Derby. Um, I'd been doing uh, paper rounds and stuff like that, and through a member of the family, I ended up getting a Saturday job at a place called Donington Computers, which is on Friargate in Derby. It was a business. Not company. in Donington. Uh, no, no. <laughs> so the guy, uh, the guy, if I remember rightly, who owned it, um, lived in Castle Derby. Donington, if nobody's familiar with the, the Derby layout, yes. uh, Castle Donington is where the Donington racetrack is, where yeah. festivals like Download Festival are, and it's about 20, 20, 30 minutes outside Derby, yeah. it's also where East Midlands Airport is. Yeah. So anyway, he had a uh, store on um, Friday, 
weirdly, only a few doors down from where Gremlin Derby uh, was, called Dynamics Computers, and sold um, the uh, Apple Business Computers, um, Dragon 32s, Oryx, and uh, a few other Jupiter Ace, was it? Can't think, I can't remember. Most of those we have in the museum. Probably got those, business. yes. <laughs> so I ended up having to get a little Saturday job um, selling these. Anyway, there was a, a, another computer shop in Derby called uh, First Bike Computers, which were up in the main centre. Now, the main centre um, doesn't exist anymore. It is now under the brand new shopping centre in Derby. So if you're trying to locate it, the uh, First Bike Computers was uh, down underneath what is now Marks and Spencer's. Uh, uh, and uh, they actually sort of, uh, uh, existed, sold a lot more home computers, like business computers. Can't quite remember what happened, but Donington computers shut, and I think part of the business was then passed on to uh, the guys at First Bike, and through that, it was like, do you want to come do a Saturday job? So I ended up working at First Bike for many years, and during my kind of college years, um, during the summer, working there. And so what you ended up having was a group of regulars that would come in, and so you'd have the guys that would go hang out in the arcades, and no doubt, yeah, and no yeah. doubt, you know, sort of thing. What were the latest games, etc.? And you get to, to know all those people. Um, and so through there, I met uh, the likes of Terry Lloyd, who yeah. um, worked with the Gremlin. Worked with the Gremlin. He actually came on and worked at First Bike for a while. He, he was, initially, when I first met him, he was unemployed. Got a job at First Bike, and then eventually uh, joined the guys at Gremlin. Rob Toon, Amy Green, Chris Shrigley, all of those guys. We all kind of gravitated around the around the store, and then when um, they started making games or whatever, that kind of created as the contacts and sort of built up from there. Or at least certainly that was my experience, and that little group that uh, formed Core in the, uh, in the beginning uh, came from, from that route. It's awesome. So one of the games that I think Core Design is most infamous for, and Derby is infamous for. If you, if you know a bit about your computer games history, it's of course Tomb Raider. Mm -hmm. um, Tomb Raider is uh, something I think people in Derby are really proud of. We've actually named our inner ring road for a large part of it, Lara Croft Way. Um, like all the road turns everything just really Lara Croft Way, which is pretty cool. Um, now, I think you left Core Design before Tomb Raider was released, didn't yeah, you? I left after seven years. I was the last of the original bunch that started with the Core. Uh, and then Tomb Raider came out maybe about two, two and a half years after that. But you did have some involvement in the the early part of the concept, didn't you? Talk yeah. about that. Um, so I was working on various different other projects, but I kind of get get pulled in to ask bits of advice and stuff on um, on various different projects uh, by uh, Jeremy and, and the creative director at that point, Guy Miller. And what has happened was is um, we'd all been to um, I think. It was would have been CES in Las Vegas, this was before it became E3 even, um, and the year that Virtual Fighter came out, and we all played it and came back going, oh my goodness, somebody is going to have to do a 3D game where you're following behind the character and you can go exploring and go anywhere and do everything kind of thing, and everybody's going to be making one of these things. Weirdly, they didn't for quite a few years, right. which was quite a surprise to us, it is that kind of weird sort of thing where you go along. Surely everybody else saw what we saw, um, but uh, all the early forays into kind of 3D were 2D games that were just being drawn in 3D for, for the longest while. But anyway, we kind of came uh, came back buzzing with that and told everybody about it. And at this point, Toby Gard had joined us um, initially as a, an artist on PC racers uh, and stuff, and he was throwing around some concepts. He, he actually got hired on the back of having done some amazing uh, duck paint animations of an Indiana Jones type character, all line drawn with a uh, with a mouse uh, in uh, um, in duck paint, kind of leaping through various different scenes and and, and and stuff, and came on board as an artist. And one of the things was that we were kind of talking about all this sort of stuff, and he was like, mm, "We could do <coughs> a three dimensional Indiana Jones type kind of game." So we started sketching up all of these ideas. Time went on, and um, Guy's thing was to try and elevate, kind of, and make differentiate between all the types of games that we're doing. So he was kind of encouraging us to all to sort of like, D 
do sort of stuff like you know explore different kind of um, racial backgrounds of characters. This is back in 1990, whenever it was, 92 or something like this kind of thing, and bring female characters into it and all this kind of stuff. And somewhere or other, along the conversation between Toby and, and uh, Guy, why not you know go for female characters? So Toby was the original artist. That yes, made, yeah, yeah. yeah, kind of like the main man for it. Um, so Toby put together this beautiful piece of, um, of sketchwork of a girl walking out of a tomb with the spiders and all this kind of stuff with the, the stone Tomb Raider letters above it and in this kind of like classic sort of 50s King Solomon Mines era sort of like kind of pose that you'd see from those kind of B-movie posters where wherein kind of from really uh, remembering sort of like pigtails and, and shorts, pith helmet, that sort of uh, uh, thing and um, I got pulled into a meeting looking at this and Jeremy was like, what do you think? And I was like, it's gorgeous, but she doesn't really look like she raids tombs. <laughs> and he was like, what can we do? So I said, why don't you make a look a bit more like Tank Girl or something like that? And so he was like, who? I was like, I will bring my comics in tomorrow. So I brought in all my Jamie Hewlett comics, popped them on his desk and went, have a look at this. She's got that kind of... And was Tank Girl a character in comic or did she have a comic? In, it was a comic created by Jamie Hewlett, okay. um, the guy who did went on to um, do all the uh, artwork for Gorillaz. Oh really? Um, yeah. Awesome. Uh, and so it was a, I don't know whether it was a spin-off of a, an, um, something like an IPC comic or an independent comic, but I just got a collection of those like, there you go. But there she is in the shorts with the big boots and all that kind of stuff. And weirdly kind of presaging the ladette culture that came many years later so Toby took those brought that kind of like style of dress uh, into it and then um, the other little kind of detail is Beauty and the Beast had hit the cinema at the time and then my mum took me to watch it the yeah, the whole sort of that. piece with a <laughs> little, little bit of hair that drops down and she pushes it out of the beat that's uh, on Lara so when you actually look at it she's this combination of Belle from Beauty and the Beast and uh, and Tank Girl. She was originally, when under Guy's direction, uh, named uh, Laura Cruz because he was kind of suggesting a kind of South American background. Um, after we left, um, the name changed and she became very English, Laura Croft, and that's where. And the, the house in the, um, like the trial initial mm -hmm. bit is modelled on the building on Ashbourne Road where Cool Design was based. Quite possibly, there. I don't know, I'd left by that point, but, right. whatever, but uh, yeah, there's sort of like one of the, one of the buildings I found very imposing. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Cool. So, from uh, what you told me before, when you kind of had me over at your house, uh, I met your your son there, mm -hmm. and it turns out that computer game development and design runs in the family, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, I will say, um, my son Ethan, um, probably about age age seven, came home from school with a what I want to do as a job, and I've still got a piece of paper where it's him sat at the desk with a pair of headphones on, making games. Amazing. And uh, bless him, he... You should have framed that up. <laughs> I, I, I kept it, kept, kept, kept it. And uh, bless him, he's uh, a real kind of like maths and logic whiz. Uh, and um, so he went off and did um, computer, uh, uh, computer science uh, degree uh, at Nottingham. And uh, basically now he works for Free Radical Design in Nottingham. Actually yeah. working for the some of the guys that worked on the original Goldeneye. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, he kind of comes in uh, every day now with kind of like, what have you been doing? We're both working on Unreal Real Engine. Um, I'm on the graphics and design side, he's on the really hardcore technical side. So I'm sort of clinging on with my fingertips as he's going, oh, don't forget pre predicate this and so and so and all this whole <laughs> very good, son. Very yeah, good. So very, very <laughs> pleased for him. Um, one of the things, actually, um, and this is kind of my advice to anybody who wants to get into games and you want to get into software, um, uh, making uh, making software, get yourself a portfolio. The tools are out there. You can do it. Um, get yourself Unity or get Unreal. Get um, downloaded Blender for three D. Game, whatever it is uh, that you need, the tools are out there. And then just start making games. And one piece of advice I gave to Ethan was like, okay, in his um, summer before his final year, uh, he was like, I've got ten weeks to, what do, you know, what can I do, kind of thing. So well, you can write a game. Like, Get on with that. <laughs> so, you know, plug in, plug in your phone. You've got an Android phone. Plug in, write a game for it. In fact, actually, you could write ten games. And so we made a list, and he wrote Snake one week, Pac-Man the next. 
shoot him up and all this kind of stuff. And at the end of the end, end of the ten weeks, he'd written ten games back to back with a full game loop, high score tables, and through that process of iteration was getting better, learning yeah. new stuff, and going, hang on a minute, six weeks ago, I did that. That was a really bad way of doing it, uh, and stuff. So I said, well, look, then, then you can go for your job. And, and then go you've in, got something to go, talk about yeah, an interview as well. This is what I, uh, you know, sort yeah. of thing. So we got the job, and it's only, I think, a handful of his, his mates actually know what the, his dad does anyway, kind of thing, yeah. if he got it all on his own merits. So if people are interested in what you're doing now mm -hmm. and find out a bit more information about you and about your history, uh, what, what can they do? Where can they find out? Well, I've got a website called uh, simonphipps.com. So if you type my name in, you'll get there. And then there's links to my Twitter and Facebook. We'll put a link to that in the description uh, as well. Instagrams and things like that kind of thing of all the little bits and pieces I'm working on. It's Plus, P -H -I -P -P -S, that's that? right. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Yeah, so yeah, no, and I've got like a, a little uh, breakdown of every single one of the games um, that, uh, that I've worked on. Hopefully, managed to credit everybody who also worked with me on them because it's pretty much a team effort most of the time. Okay, mm. awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming. I You're really, really welcome. appreciate it. Thank you for not getting a restraining order when <laughs> I, I stalked you to, to do this video. I much appreciate it. So this video is created by Derby Computer Museum. Uh, this is one of our first videos, if not our first video. So as everybody always says on YouTube, please like, subscribe, click the bell icon, turn around, jump up and down, everything else you're supposed to do. Um, Derby Computer Museum is all run by volunteers. We're a registered charity and we all do this because we believe in our mission. So our mission is to preserve and maintain computing history. Speaking to Simon and finding out a bit about what he does and how you know, computer games were created back in the day is part of maintaining that history. We also uh, want to create something in Derby for families to do on a Saturday. Um, you don't have to be from Derby to come here, but um, you know, you're more than welcome to travel further afield. There's plenty of parking nearby. One of our other missions as well is to be an educational resource. So during the week, we are available for school field trips as well as corporate fun days. And we also work with a sixth form down the road for kids with special educational needs, so autism, Down syndrome and various other things, to give them work experience. So they've been amazing, Horizon sixth form, they've asset tagged everything here, uh, they've restored the chairs that we donated uh, from Nando's, they've, uh, they've polished them all and sand and cooled down, they've done a wonderful job. So if you get a chance to visit, please, please do. If you get a chance to support us anyway, we really, really appreciate it. Everybody is doing this because we want to do it and because we believe in it, not because we're getting paid in any way to do it. So thank you very much for watching. Simon, thank you very thank much you for coming in. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.